And John Fung often said that when we're practicing the Dharma, we're working on a skill. We're not just memorizing words or ideas. We're learning how to deal skillfully with issues in the mind. And the first principle in that skill, he would say, is the breath, how we relate to the breath. Because there are many layers in the mind. Some are more conscious than others. And one of the ways we get in touch with the more unconscious ones, and it can actually deal effectively with problems that lie down in those layers, is to work with the breath. You notice when you're feeling irritated, what happens? Your breath changes. And sometimes the breath will change even before you're conscious of the irritation. There's a little catch in your heart or a catch in your stomach, and your breathing gets labored. That's a sign something's got to be done. Well, you can do something about it, working not directly on the mind at that point, but working with the breath. Learn how to breathe through that sense of irritation, because otherwise the defilement that's down there is going to take over your breath energy. And the part of the mind that wants to develop a skill suddenly finds itself without any friends, and without any support. So you make this your support. Relate to the breath always. Notice how it's going. Notice what you can do to breathe through any knots of tension, any irregularities. When the breathing gets labored, try to calm it down, smooth it out. First stages of the breath meditation the Buddha taught was first noticing when the breath is long, when it's short. In other words, observing what's going on. And you can expand that in many directions to when it's heavy, when it's light, when it's comfortable or not. And then the next step is to be aware of the whole body. I should breathe in, the whole body should breathe out. That's to get in touch with how the rhythm and texture of your breathing are either being affected by some other part of the body or having an effect on another part of the body. And then, as the Buddha says, you try to calm the bodily fabrication. In other words, you calm the way you're breathing. So it has a soothing effect throughout the body. If you find yourself running up against a pain and the pain feels like a wall, think of the breath just penetrating right through. Wherever there's a blockage of any kind, think of the breath penetrating right through. And that way you get to reclaim your body. And that can help you as you deal with other issues that come up. But remember, as you're dealing with those others, just don't leave the sense of the body. Because if you suddenly find your awareness way outside the body or the body's being blotted out, who knows what's going on inside the body, and it can undermine your other, other efforts. For example, you notice that when the, the Buddha teaches the Eightfold Path, he starts with the right view, right resolve. These are the factors of discernment. And then putting that discernment into practice, he starts first with right speech. The right speech also is a skill, it's an art. Because all too often our attitude is either we want to say something, just get it out of our system, or we bottle it up because either out of fear or, or a sense that we shouldn't say it. And if those are only two options, we're going to blow up. Either we blow up by getting it out, the explosion is outside, or blow up inside. But part of the blowing up inside it comes from this sense of the breath suddenly getting uncomfortable. And that affects the rest of the energies in the body, you begin to panic. So you've got to realize you've got this other alternative. You don't have to bottle it up and you don't have to let it out. As the Buddha says, when you speak one, you want to make sure that it's true. But then two, you want to make sure it's beneficial. Will this really have a good effect, both on yourself and on other people? And three, is this the right time to say something pleasant, or is this the right time to say something unpleasant? One of the major misconceptions about right speech is that you never say anything harmful. That old saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. That's not the Buddha's approach. He recognized that there are times you have to say unpleasant things to help other people realize that they're doing something mistaken. You look at his 
teachings to the monks, especially in the Vinaya. Someone does something wrong and calls them worthless person, which is harsh. And he gives them real dressing down. But in all those cases, we notice when the Buddha asks you, did you actually do this, the people will fess up and say, yes, that's something I did. So the fact that they're willing to tell the truth means that they're ready to hear something. So when you're looking at right speech, remember, you, you try to think strategically. What will be the impact of your words, and when can you speak, and how can you speak? to make sure that that impact really is effective and beneficial. There are four kinds of right speech the Buddha talks about. One is truthful. You avoid telling lies. In other words, you don't intentionally misrepresent the truth. Two, you don't say anything divisive. You don't try to separate friends from another or prevent a friendship from happening. Three, you don't say anything coarse or harsh, i.e. with the intention of hurting somebody's feelings. And four, you don't engage in idle chatter. Now, each of these four types of right speech are not just things you avoid. There's a positive side as well. In telling the truth, it's not the case that you tell everything. The Buddha says if certain things, when you say them, will give rise to greed, aversion, or delusion in you or in the person you're speaking to. Therefore, if your intention is to give rise to greed, aversion, or delusion in them, you can't be totally responsible for their response. But if you're anticipating that it would give rise to those things, you don't say it, no matter how true it is. As for divisive speech, there are times when you have to warn someone about dangers. But at the same time, you also have to learn how to speak in ways that bring people into harmony. It's not just negative kinds of speech that you avoid. There are also positive ones that you want to develop. This is where it's really helpful to have good examples. Because often, on your own, it's very difficult to think of how to say something that would lead to more harmony in the community. If you haven't seen anybody speak in those ways, speak effectively in those ways. And this is where you have to do some mental exercise. And sometimes you can devote a meditation to this. Not all meditation is about just being with the present moment. Sometimes you have to anticipate future difficulties and how you might deal with them. In terms of the path, this is a part of right effort trying to prevent unskillful qualities from arising. And you do it by thinking, okay, I'm going to go in this situation, and there tends to be this problem in that situation. And what could I say that would defuse it? One of my favorite examples of this was a man who was coming to tell me one time he works in an office where everybody else is an evangelical Christian. He's a Buddhist. And they were having an office party, and he knew that they were going to sit him down at some point and give him a good heart-to-heart -heart talk on taking Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. So the question was, how was he going to deal with that? And his approach was, during the volleyball game, before the heart-to-heart -heart talk, right at the end of the game, he noticed he had everybody's attention, so he said, I want to comment on how what really good Christians you are and not giving me a hard time about my being a Buddhist. There was no heart-to-heart -heart talk. So when you anticipate a problem, give it some thought. What would be the most effective thing to say? If you try it out and it doesn't work, we'll go back to the drawing board. This is the Buddha's basic teaching to Rahula. You make a mistake, well, you think through what could have been done differently. And learn to take your mistakes in, in stride. And that way you really do learn. The same goes with harsh speech. There are times when you have to speak very strongly, but you have to be careful. Because sometimes people will take it in the wrong way. So you have to know, okay, this is a serious issue, and sometimes you really have to show that it is a serious issue by indicating using strong language. As for idle chatter, the, the positive correlate to idle chatter is talk that is worthwhile. As the Buddha says, reasonable, seasonable, connected with actual benefit. In other words, you don't just 
run off at the mouth with whatever you want to say. You ask yourself, okay, what will be the impact of these words? When you're working with a group, how much friendly chatter is necessary to keep things running smoothly and then how much gets in the way of the work. This is something you've got to be very sensitive about. But all this does is it focuses attention on your intentions. When you speak, are you intending to misrepresent the truth? Are you intending to break a friendship? Are you intending to hurt someone's feelings? Are you have no real clear intention at all? Okay, be careful. None of that is going to be right speech. So it's in this way that mastering right speech focuses attention on the mind. And of course, your habits of speech in the world outside are going to come inside your mind. The things you tend to say to other people, you also tend to say to yourself. And so as you're sitting here meditating with the verbal fabrications going on in your mind, telling yourself this, telling yourself that, if you have some careful practice in learning how to speak, with clear intentions, speaking strategically, speaking with goodwill, even when the message happens to be harsh. Then you'll find yourself an easier person to live with as you meditate and as you go through the day. So this is one of the reasons why the Buddha put right speech before right mindfulness or right concentration, because it gives you practice in how to talk to others and how to talk to yourself. And that way, when you're talking to yourself about the breath, again, it's the same sort of thing. Is the breath going well? Is your mind settling down with the breath? If it's not, how do you think strategically in a way that gets it to settle down, that it's willing to settle down, it's happy to settle down, and you can keep it there? And that way your speech gets in touch with your breath. And your breath puts you in touch with layers of the mind you might not have suspected were there, things going on inside. It's just all connected. And the Forest of John's talked about this many times, of how the path comes together. You focus on one aspect of the path and it starts connecting with this other aspect, this factor, that factor. The factors all become one. And that's when they, the path can yield its full results, which is something that goes beyond the path. And again, when you think about what goes beyond the path, it's opening your mind to other possibilities that you might normally have thought were possible. This is one thing I've noticed again and again reading books on Western Buddhism, is that People don't really seem to have any room in their imagination for something that goes beyond what they've already attained or what they've already seen. And they cut themselves they cut themselves off some from some really great benefits. I mean, it is it is possible to reach a happiness that goes beyond fabrication, that goes beyond intentions. Where all the dimensions of space and time fall away. But to get there, you've got to look very carefully at your intentions. You can't know what is truly unintended until you're thoroughly familiar with all the levels of fabrication and intention going on in the mind. So start with your speech, start with your breath, and work inward. And give the Buddha's teachings a chance. <laughs>